Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. Uh, years ago, George Harrison did a song called Cracker Box Palace, and he used his own home in the video. And it always fascinated me because the place was such a large place, and I just wondered when did he get it and what inspired him to get it. So today we're going to look into that. So uh, when did George find out about the place? Well, him and his wife, Patty, were living in Esther and on a property called Ken Fonz. They decided to move to Friar Park when the new year of 1970 began. George said, Ken Fonz was too small, too conventional, too exposed. He was seeking the absolute peace of complete privacy during his hunt for a new home, but also insisted on a private lake because the water is very peaceful for the mind. So Patty said, George said to me, I don't care what the house is like as long as it's not on the road and there is room to put a recording studio. So at Escher, the girls managed to get into the garden, even into the house, and it was a bit of a nightmare. And George really wanted a studio where he could work on stuff himself, and that was the real reason for the big house. And also, there was a girls' school that was near the property, so that didn't help. But the headmistress had told them to give George and Patty privacy, so George was glad for that. But then other fans found the place, and one time, George and Patty returned to discover two fans had broken in and were hiding under the bed. So that must have been scary. <laughs> so next, Patty found a place called Plumpton Place near Lewis in uh, East Sussex at the end of a sweeping drive, surrounded by moats and gardens. But the elderly owner refused Harrison's offer because she didn't want to rock and roll musicians buying her lovely house. But later she had a change of heart and sold it to Jimmy Page. <laughs> So it must have been fate that Patty next saw a small advertisement in the Sunday Times placed by the Salzian Sisters of St. John Bosco. The nuns had been running a school in Friar Park in, Hensley, in Henley on the Thames, which had recently closed, and the remarkable building was now facing demolition unless a buyer could be found. So it was inhabited by six nuns and a monk. So a boy went to view it, and she fell in love. So Harrison came next on the next day, and they fell equally hard. So this was built by Sir Frank Crisp in 1898 on the site of an old monastery. The red brick neo-Gothic pile was an essay in English eccentricity. Uh, Harrison paid 140,000 pounds. It bought him a gatehouse, two lodges, 12 acres of formal gardens, and 20 acres of land, a three-story mansion with 25 bedrooms and numerous public rooms, including a ballroom and a library. And there were turrets, towers, and parapets with glowing gargoyles. So the previous owner, he was a lawyer and an amateur horticulturist. Uh, Crisp was clearly a wonderful man with a great sense of humor. And he traveled extensively and brought back all sorts of things he discovered in other countries, said Patty. And his attention to detail was exquisite and just what George understood. He loved it for many reasons. Well, the parkland opened to the public during crisp lifetime and long after his death in 1919 was a cross between a botanical garden, a fairground attraction, and Lewis Carroll's Wonderland. The centerpiece was an alpine garden and a replica of the Matterhorn made from 20,000 tons of Yorkshire granite. So there was a series of man-made underground caves and grottos through which one could travel by boat from one lake to another, and the journey was enlivened by distorted circus mirrors, gnomes, fairies, toadstools, and shimmering blue glass. And above the ground, there was Elizabethan and Japanese gardens, a topiary, a maze, signs on the lawn read, keep, don't keep off the grass. So what shape did George find the place in? According to the book, George Harrison, Behind the Locked Door by Graham Thompson, when George and Patty moved in, the gardens had been used as a local dump, Brambles and ivy covered everything, and the lakes had been filled in, and internally the house was a state of disrepair, with grass growing through the floors, whole walls crumbling, and many parts of the building closed off. In the early months, uh, Patty and George lived like squatters. There was no heating, no furniture, no beds, and they slept in the hall in sleeping bags, wrapped in coats and scarves, with a fire burning constantly in a huge grate. And then they almost froze in. And even then, they almost froze. The only other inhabitable space was the original kitchen, a huge tile room with flagstone floors, industrial-sized sinks, and a walk-in pantry. 
Slowly, with the guiding hand of architect David Platt, they began to restore parts of the property. And for a time, they lived in one of the lodges. In the back of the house, they could sleep on a mattress on a floor in a different room every other night. It was a game. We were like children. We were playing, Boyd said. We could decorate. We embarked on a huge garden program. It was so exciting. It was huge fun. I wonder how much that cost. It had to be, I tried to find the price of the, of what it took to get the place back to its glorious self, but I was never able to find it. So George's main goal was to get it back to how it was before the nuns had it and closed everything up. And he read everything he could and got all this information from people in the village who knew the house, and it became his passion. And then Patty had her mind inside the house, and he had his outside the house. So he loved the gardens. John Lennon, he popped around, and he called it Henley on the toast, on toast and thought that Friar Park was a little gloomy. So George not only worked on a home, but on an album. So George decided to make an album about the same time he was upgrading the home. Musicians started popping in, and they got a tour, and every new visitor got a tour and a sleeping bag, and the first person up in the morning brought everyone else tea. George and Bobby Whitlock started exploring the place. We put on the boots and the jackets, got a couple of torches, and went down this hole in his yard, and suddenly we were in a tunnel with a creek going down the middle of it. He said it was really interesting. Came out on another pond and another tunnel, a cave, one bathroom had 12 wooden holes going around the walls, and all the light switches had little fryers. It was very cold. I stayed up right at the very top of the tallest room in the tower, room 101, Patty called it. So George's schedule at that time in the morning, it was tea, eggs, or porridge, and newspapers at the kitchen table. Then George would go into London to record, or he would start working down the house and gardens. At night, there would be Indian cooking, and they would sit in the kitchen to eat, drink, and talk. Harrison might play them as new songs, or he might disappear to meditate. And then they would go listen to music or watch movie in a makeshift screening room in the office next to the kitchen. George loved the producers, said Odell, and I can't tell you how many times we watched that in a very short space of time. His favorite new TV show was Monty Python's Flying Circus. George felt a peace there. George would be out there squinting because he could see at midnight the moonlight and the shadows, and that was his way of not seeing the weeds or imperfections that would plague him during the day. Talking of the tranquility he felt at Friar Park, Harrison said, sometimes I feel like I'm actually on the wrong planet, and it's great when I'm in my garden. He said, but the minute I go out of the gate, I think, what the hell am I doing here? George Harrison felt a little shell-shocked during those Beatlemania days, he wanted a place to get away from it all and enjoy the peace and quiet, and he found it, thanks to his first wife, Patty Boyd. The first owner of the house was a man who was a lot like George, and it was a perfect fit for him, a place where he really got into gardening, and he would often garden until midnight, and it was a place he could escape in. So I hope everybody liked the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would really help the channel out, and it also helps me to see if I'm going in the right direction video-wise. I also hope that everybody's been having a good day and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.